Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I trust your commands. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Let us sing number 529, How Firm a Foundation. Almighty God, who by your word brings all things into being, who by your word orders life according to your holiness, who by your living word incarnate, Jesus Christ, brings new life to all who believe. We come to worship you, to listen to your voice bringing truth and life and to unite our voices in praise and adoration. Forgive us when we choose other words as authorities in our life. Help us to trust your word, and so be your people, now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now let us say those words together that make the foundation of our faith, um, the affirmation of faith, our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary.
Please be seated. We come to this time of prayer, lifting up thanksgivings and celebrations and praises, uh, and also intercessions, petitions uh, for ourselves and for others. Uh, let me start by naming a couple of our, of our ministry. Gracious God, we come to you first to listen, to hear your voice, for you to impress upon us prayers that we should remember, lift up, service we should offer. Stirred by your spirit, we name those this day aloud and those in our hearts, those grieving May they be comforted. Those recovering, may they be strengthened, healed. For those births and lives we celebrate and for the gift of love and life and marriage. We pray for those about to have surgery. We, we pray for the children and youth of this church as they begin to, to study again and grow in Christ. And for all the adults who are going to help us and keep this ministry going. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Ocracoke and Hatteras and Cedar Island and all parts east as they suffer the aftermaths of Dory. We pray, Lord, that you will stir us as a people to be faithful, to seek truth, to offer love, and to give you all the glory. For we pray in Jesus' name who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 9 through 13. Hear God's word. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in it the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be for the Lord a memorial, an everlasting sign that will not be cut off. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, and now we invite all of the children who are worshiping with us this morning to come join Mr. Rodney up front for a special children's moment. Wow, good morning. How, what a beautiful group to be up here with me for this 11 o'clock service. I appreciate it. I only had my grandchildren with me for the first service. But they're pretty too. But yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll be quicker. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Do, do any of y'all play sports? Volleyball? Do you like sports? Yeah. And see, I grew up loving sports and still do, probably too much so. And also, coach, I'm very blessed to coach sports, particularly baseball. And uh, I learned in coaching baseball 
that uh, I, I like defense and I like to tell if you're playing shortstop what I want you to do with the ball if it's hit to you. And uh, I, I realize if I scream and yell, no one listens to me anyway. And so I, I developed a sign system, brilliantly, by the way, I may add, okay? <laughs> Brilliant sign system, and I use, uh, if I want you to throw it to first base, I use the colors of the flag. First base is red, second base is white, third, place is, third base is blue. Got it? They don't either, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's home, every now and then you have to use home. And, and, and I expect them to respond to my signs and uh, remember what I want them to do with the baseball when it's hit to them. A lot of times they don't understand what I'm saying and they don't believe what I'm saying. <laughs> but I reflected on that in, in what I'm t teaching today is the world is like that. The world will give you poor instruction and, and wrap it in beautiful packages, if you will, won't it? And Reverend Powell is preaching today about the real truth in this world, which is the scripture that's involved in the Bible. And we people of faith are, uh, uh, have great faith in the fact that the word of the Bible is God-inspired. Amen? Amen? And you hear that a lot from your parents and from your teachers and from preachers, and, and it's, it's the truth. And so, so our guidance in our own lives is not my fancy signs or my brilliance. I'm being facetious when I say that, but uh, uh, is that the, we have the scripture to follow. Is that good? Say yes. Yeah. Say that's the greatest thing you've ever heard. <laughs> Are you all right with that? Okay. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> she, she gave me a high five. So that's, <laughs> she's a sports fan, too. May we bow our heads. Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you for the word and the grace and mercy we learn from your word and the great guidance that you, that you give us. And, and praise for preachers and teachers and family uh, that teach us this word as young people so that we may grow in the right path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Let us continue our worship of Almighty God this morning through the giving back of God's tithes and our offerings.
next hymn is number 598, O Word of God Incarnate. Please be seated. Hear the word of God from 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with the 14th verse. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, send your word. Help us to hear. Help us to believe. Help us to live by your word. Amen. 
So I've played this game with you before. Humor me. Everyone hold your hands up like this. And now hold them exactly seven and three quarter inches apart. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm right. <laughs> Okay. Who's right? Who's right? If you're a philosopher, you might say, I think I'm right, therefore I am. You'll get it. If you're a traditionalist, you might say, it's always been this wide. If you're a modernist, you might say, everyone can be right if they want to be. <laughs> if you're a pragmatist, you might say, it just doesn't matter all that much. Which might be true unless we're talking about a seven and three quarter inch, too short lifeline being thrown to a drowning person. Who's right? And how do you know for sure? What is your authority? What defines truth for you? Is it culture? You know, I read it on the internet, so it must be true. <laughs> is it Hollywood? Well, I saw it in the movies and in a commercial, and it seemed okay, so it must be true. Is it your preacher or a professor? Well, someone I trust told me it was true. Is it your feelings? I feel that this is true. Or is it your intellect? Well, the way I think of course, is right and true. How will you know? One of my key teaching principles in Bible studies is everyone has a right to an opinion. But having an opinion doesn't make it right. What is your authority? What defines truth for you? That was a major question in the Reformation. Last week, we began our series on core values. We're looking at the five solas. Grace, Scripture, Faith, Christ, and the glory of God. Foundational principles of our faith. And, and I introduced us again to Martin Luther, one of the key figures in what became such a, a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal time of refocusing and reframing of the Christian faith. Martin Luther came to believe, and he argued even to the point of giving his life, that truth was subordinate and subject to the Bible to the Holy Scriptures, God's gift to the world. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Now you could argue, and certainly people did then, now wait a minute, wait a minute, isn't God the ultimate authority? And you'd be right, but it's the conviction of the Christian faith that we can only know God, we can only know Jesus, and therefore know God's will and truth as God sees fit to reveal it. As God chooses to make himself known. We don't have that in and of ourselves. God must reveal it, and that revelation is the Scripture. Of itself, the Bible declares, 
All scripture is inspired. The translation I read said, God breathed. Inspired. That means it, it comes out of God's heart from God to communicate to us life and truth to all who believe. You may want to argue, well, it was people who wrote the Bible and established the scriptures. And you'd be right to a degree. But it is the conviction of the Christian faith that God guided the writing and the establishment of the scriptures by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, friends, of course, Jesus didn't have the completed collection of these 66 books of the Bible. But if you want to argue that we should only accept the scriptures Jesus had, then you're going to be left with just the Old Testament. Do, do you really want that? The gathering of the early church prayed through this and by the Holy Spirit determined the range of the scriptures included in the Bible. In an Easter letter in 367 AD, Astonatius, who was the Bishop of Alexandria, wrote of this, this now is canonized. The word canon means the measure or rule. The breadth of God's truth has been established. Oh, you may say to me, well, I don't like everything in the scriptures. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> I, I don't know too many Christians or pastors who understand every verse of the Bible or like them either. But whether I understand it or like it, it is holy scripture. And if you want to start picking and choosing verses and whole Bibles, whole books of the Bible, then you are right back to you being the source of authority for yourself. You could even argue, maybe you should argue, but we don't worship the scriptures, we worship Jesus. And you are so right. But without the scriptures, how would you know which Jesus to worship? We need the whole of the scriptures from beginning to the end, from Genesis to Revelation, for us to be able to begin to grasp for the fullness of God in Jesus Christ. Go back to Martin Luther for a moment. The world in which Martin Luther was trained was called scholasticism. And in that day, they actually taught people uh, to read scholarly commentaries on the Bible rather than read the Bible. Uh, that's sort of like when I'm in a Bible study and somebody is looking in their Bible down in all the notes, the annotations, and they go, well, my Bible says, no, it doesn't. The notes say. It's interesting, it's, it's almost ironic that back then the novices, the beginners at the monastery, when they gave up all their earthly possessions to enter the monastery, were allowed to keep one thing and that was a Bible. But as soon as they were ordained priests, they began to read everything else. And there were not Bibles available for the general public. In mass. Now, for history buffs, and forgive me if you're not, but I, there are two other people that you should know. One is John Wycliffe. He was a professor at Oxford University in England. In 1384, he translated the Latin Bible called the Vulgate. Uh, Latin was the language of the priests and the scholars, but he translated it from that into Middle English so that everyone could begin to read. God's Word. And Johannes Gutenberg in 1455, who because he had movable type with his printing press, 
began to print Bibles and make them available outside the monasteries and the academies. The work of those two men were stepping stones for the journey that the Reformation would take in the 1500s. Why does all this matter? Because this is our heritage. This is our Christian foundation. The scriptures are God's gift to us. Without them, we would have no knowledge of God. No knowledge of God's plan and future for us. No guidance for how to live in right relationship to God. John Wesley, the pastor who was the moving force behind this thing called Methodism, once wrote, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. How to land safely on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach the way. For this very end he came from heaven. He hath written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be homo unius libri. A man of one book. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. This book, it's actually more like a library of writings collected. It deserves our disciplined study. It's not an easy read. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> it's not an easy read in any language. There are things in here that when you read them may seem confusing, disconnected, and even at first, but only then, inconsistent or incongruous. And that's why we study. That's why we work to understand God's truth. That's why we apply reason and tradition and experience to help us understand the deep truth of God's Word. Now, I believe God inspires other beautiful writings throughout time. But Scripture is always primary. It is the measure, the rule of truth. Let me offer it differently in order to give you some images to ponder as you approach the Scripture. The scriptures are like a telescope. They take something that seems far and distant and brings it close. Through the lens of scriptures, the details of God's face, meaning the nature and the character and the heart of God, they become clearer to us, more visible. And the scriptures take what is far and future of God's plan and brings it into the present so that we can see them in focus and in truth today. The scriptures are like a family scrapbook. Now I know there are some that are still only in the digital age. That means your pictures are still in your camera. <laughs> but I wish that everyone at least once had the blessing of sitting down with a parent or a grandparent and looking back through a family scrapbook with letters and pictures and certificates and mementos. The scriptures are our family story. They tell the story of our history as God's people and the journey that God has taken with us. The scriptures allow us to read love letters from God to his beloved people. The scriptures allow us to see story pictures of God's miraculous hand of deliverance and healing, of compassion and grace. Friends, what a tragedy if we ignore or lose this family heirloom. The scriptures are like a mirror held up before us to help us see ourselves as we really are. 
Now, first, that means in the image of God. Created for a purpose and a future. And God loves us, blemishes and all. But until we are, are humble enough to see ourselves in truth and to acknowledge our blemishes and our sins, then we are not really open to mercy and grace. The scriptures confront us with the truth of our brokenness, but then show us the way of redeeming. The scriptures are like a lantern, a light, a, a lighthouse, holding everything in the light, revealing the dangerous shoals on which we could crash and, and be destroyed, and also lighting the way into the safe harbor of God's holiness and love. The scriptures are like a compass and a map. Below 30, I have to say, a GPS. <laughs> they point us to the true north, towards the only true fixed reference point, God. They map out for us the path we're to walk. And friends, the path is more narrow than you think. And the scriptures are like guardrails to, to keep us between the lines. And the scriptures mark out the landmines and the cliffs where we could get injured or be destroyed. The scriptures are like a defibrillator. We have some of those around the building. Please, I hope you never have to use them. They are the power of life. The prophet Isaiah said, God's word that comes from his mouth does not go out and then return empty. But it accomplishes that which God desires. And God desires it to accomplish life. I was reared in a Christian home by really wonderful Christian parents. And they drug me. I mean, I went to church <laughs> every single week. But it wasn't until I began to genuinely read the scriptures earnestly and with a seeking mind and heart that my heart became alive and I gave my life to Jesus. In the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, verses 30 and 31, it says, Jesus did many miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Written so that you and I may have life. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now let's stand and sing. Number 600. Wonderful words of life.
the benediction, you're invited to join together in the singing of the response printed in your bulletin. Now receive this blessing. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sustaining fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and forevermore. Amen.